Hello, once again, Pats, pals, and Foxborough friends. We welcome you to the latest and always greatest, and this time, we really mean it, edition of Six Rings and Football Things, brought to you by your friends at WEI, Odyssey, and 2400 Sports. If you think you have been exhausted by this interminable offseason, which technically began halfway through the middle of last dysfunctional season, mm-hmm. mock draft fatigue, and everything else that has dragged the once glorious franchise of Foxbro that is the New England Patriots down into the muck, into the mire and mediocrity. Well, we are here today to build you back up one baldy breakdown at a time because your pals Nick Fitzy Stevens and Andy Jumbo Hart are joined by the legend himself, the great Brian Baldinger from NFL Network and, of course, our Odyssey football insider. Baldy! How's your off season been, guy? You're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's the off season, so I mean, you gotta. I mean, it is vacation season, so I, I can't imagine off seasons without a lot of vacations. But in between, you know, I grind the tape and talk to the you know people that are sort of making these decisions uh, starting next Thursday. So I feel like I'm I'm ready to take my test next Thursday. And you uh, see, we just fixate on the Patriots. So it, as Fitzy said, you know, we've been talking quarterback since like November. You know, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, we, we've beaten Hey, it. Andy, listen, I was talking about your quarterback situation. I had the uh, I had the luxury of going to Foxborough last year to do that game against the Saints where he didn't score a point. Uh, and I said, this team is, lo- this luxury, team is in trouble. Man. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know what to make of it. I was like, the Saints could have – the Patriots could have had the ball 100 times. They could have rotated, you know, Mac Jones with Bailey Zappi back and forth. They weren't scoring a point that day. And I was like, this team's in trouble. Like, yep. this is a bad roster. This is a, this isn't going to go well. And so you might have started in November. I saw it in October. Like, <laughs> and, and, and I wasn't afraid to say it because it was bad. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it's a weird feeling for those of us. Like, I've been covering this team for 20 plus years. Yeah. And, you know, we fell into the good groundhog day where it was like, ah, wake me up after Thanksgiving. What seed do we have? When's the yeah. AFC title game? And now it's just the total opposite. And in some ways, it's refreshing. I don't know if you got a chance to see Elliot Wolf's press conference yesterday. Definitely a different vibe is the, the word they've used, tone, he and mm-hmm. Josh McDaniels. But the reality is, next Thursday night, as Robert Kraft has been acknowledging, they're going to make the biggest draft pick of his ownership era. And... That's a lot of pressure for a guy like Elliot Wolf. You know, the Wolf family name, that's that's really yeah. good and cool and yeah. everything. But do you just sort of 3,000 foot, 30,000 foot, whatever, however yeah. high you want to go view, where do you see the Patriots right now in this? Is it as simple as just stay at three and take a quarterback, or you think there's a lot more involved here? I think there's more involved. I mean, they only have five picks. They have, uh, you know, the roster needs a lot of work, especially in offense. So, I mean, you have to listen – Elliot has to listen to any phone calls that are coming from whoever. You have, you know, you have to take the calls, and you got to see what's what's available. But at the same time, I'm sure Gerard and Elliot and Mr. Crafts, they don't want to be picking three again. And maybe there's a quarterback next year or the year after. But I, I feel like you might as well. if and, and they have said this, and they've been very direct, I think, in all the press conferences. I, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of subterfuge here. But I feel like – they have to be in love with the quarterback, whoever that third guy is. We might not know yet. Maybe we do. Maybe Washington's made a decision. We know what Chicago's going to do. So you have to be in love with the guy. Everything about him, just what he stands for, he's going to be the face of the organization. He's inheriting a bad team. I wouldn't want to play quarterback with the left side of the offensive line the way it is right now. Uh, but, you know, th- those things you address. If you get the right guy, you will address those things and you will – you will fix it, and you'll never stop building around them. So I feel like if their quarterback is there that they love, they're going to take them. Yeah, now it's interesting because I've checked out your rankings, and I've watched some of your breakdowns, and I've also heard you on some of our other Odyssey Sister Family Football podcasts as well. You know, I know you have Drake May rated as your fourth best quarterback overall, yet the Patriots are picking third. Um, I've heard, I read this morning 
Mike Florio reporting Jaden Daniels doesn't want to go play for the commanders as well. Uh, you've got people that say McCarthy's the better prospect. You like Michael Penix a bit more as well. You were talking to the silver and black today, guys about him. Uh, so, you know, all, all things being equal, if you're the Patriots and they just lo- they happen to have their power ranking of quarterbacks, do you think they stick with their conviction and do what Andy says and, you know, take Drake or should they, you know, or should they maybe give some consideration to someone else like, like you say with some other better prospects like Penix, who I happen to be a fan of as well. Yeah. I mean, I like Michael Penix. I mean, I, I you know, I've been saying that since uh, probably when I started really studying him hard, like in March and I've been, and I had met him at the Super Bowl, and you know, talked to him a couple of times. I liked everything about him. I liked his mental makeup. I liked that he went and rescued a program at Washington that was just morbid and awful, and mm-hmm. with a new coach. And you know, his offense. You know, I feel like honestly, you know, you're trying to elevate your program. They they need a guy to come in and elevate this program right now. You need more than just a quarterback. It'd be help if you know Matt Judon is healthy and Christian Gonzalez is back. I mean, all that stuff's going to help. But I feel like. You know, when I watched Michael Penix, I, I saw a guy leave Indiana under a bunch of injuries and go to Washington with Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grubb, and he convinces Roma Dunze and Jalen McMillan, Jalen Polk to stay. They're all going to leave. Yep. And he convinces them to stay. He's like, let's go to work. Let's get to work and let's do this thing together. Like, that's kind of what you have to do at the NFL level. You have to, like, start building this, this chemistry with the quarterback and the coach and the players. And I felt like we just watched this guy do it to the point where they were 30 minutes away from winning a national championship. And I don't know if you put JJ McCarthy at Washington, or if you put, uh, you know, Drake may at Washington, if they would have done the same thing that Michael Penix jr. Did. So that's an interesting um, sort of part of this is we saw Mac Jones come in, have a year that worked out really well. Great, yep. great year. Okay. They go to the playoffs. Then the bottom fell out, the coaching, the scheme. He, They broke him. You know, we've used the phrase here on Six Rings, they broke him. They took a quarterback yep. that seemed capable, yep. and he ended up being a puddle of goo. Yep. When you look at quarterbacks, because you referenced something, you said, you know, the left side of the line, and there's questions about receiver. Yesterday, Elliot Wolf said he doesn't buy that narrative. He thinks they have NFL caliber talent on the line, NFL caliber talent at receiver, but This idea of being QB ready, is that a thing? Or if the guy is a true franchise quarterback, like you firmly believe uh, sounds like Penix is, if the guy has it, whatever that it is, and I know that's a weird word, do you just take him and say, we'll figure everything else out because it doesn't break. It doesn't need a roster that's ready around him. It will be able to maintain until we surround him. Like, how does that play into your thinking? Well, I mean, I don't believe Elliot. Flat out. Like, I don't believe I don't believe what he said yesterday about receivers and left side of the line. I don't believe it. Like you could say, okay, let's just say CJ Stroud last year. Well, he had Laramie Tunsil protecting him back. I mean, he's as good as there is at left tackle in his business. Right. You know, and so his backside was protected. If he wanted to hold the ball and wait for Nico Collins to come open, he had a, an extra tick. Like, I don't believe you're gonna get that with Connor McDermott. I just don't believe it. Like I've seen him in different places, and I know he started some games last year. And I'm not here to knock Connor McDermott, but that's not what you want as a franchise left tackle. Maybe if Tom Brady was still playing, you know, he made all those guys look better on the left side. They all got paid. You know, we all know who, you know, Nate Solder, like we found out what Nate Solder was when he got that money, went to the Giants. Like he wasn't that good. And that, that's kind of what you're looking at right now. And you'll tell me that you can't tell me these receivers. I, I know they signed KJ Osborne, but don't tell me that Jalen Rager, or any of these guys they have out there, Kendrick Bourne, are difference makers in this division. Go line them up against the Jets' corners, see how they do. So I don't necessarily believe it, but I also uh, believe that if they if they think that Drake May is their future, then go get them. Like, and then go figure out the left tackle, left guard, receiver positions. Go figure it out. But don't wait till next year and see what happens. Like, go get them. I I believe that. If, if they believe that about Drake or whoever might be there, then go make that, go pull that, uh, you know, go pull that card and and go start building right now. And look, we all know quarterback is the most important position, not just in 
football, but in all major North American professional sports. And you're not going anywhere without a decent one, let alone a mobile, a strong armed one, a very hyper athletic one in the 2024 NFL. Yet two things here. Uh, last night I was at an event and I had a chance to speak with uh, the play by play voice on the radio of the Patriots and a bunch of beat reporters and media personalities. And they all said, if you just obviously push aside quarterback, when you were watching all the games last year, what is the one thing that stuck out the most that was the most glaring need and issue on this team? And to a man, they all said, oh, wide receiver. Like there's just yeah. no, no one takes the top off. Nobody keeps defensive coordinators or opposing safeties and corners up at night. They need a difference maker. And I'd like to add to this that yesterday, Rodney Harrison and Tony Dungy were doing a podcast and Rodney Dungy, uh, excuse me, right. Just part of it. Confuse the names. Rodney Harrison said, don't take something you need and pass up something that's special. That's the quote. That's why he and fellow former New England Patriot James White both love and wish the Patriots would take Marvin Harrison Jr. third overall. Could you see the Patriots, you know, Elliot Wolf's supposed to be a best available guy. If he's high up on the board, do you think they would, you know, choose chaos and just go for an absolute stud and then work on the issues later on? Or is that just crazy talk? No, I mean, it, 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 look, I think you have to review every possible scenario uh, to the point where you just wear yourself out the way we get kind of worn out talking about all this stuff. But you have to do that. And so I don't think there's a big difference between Marvin Harrison Jr. and Roma Dunze and, you know, Malik Neighbors. I just don't think there's a big difference. I mean, I think Roma Dunze in some days is the best receiver in this draft. And there's plenty of metrics and plenty of tape to go watch to convince yourself of that. If that's the case, can you trade down, still get a receiver, and get yourself a left tackle in this in this draft? You probably could do both. And that, to me, would make this team a whole lot better than, you know, maybe taking a quarterback that sits behind, uh, you know, the quarterback right now. And I don't know, but maybe that's not the, the best thing for the future of the franchise. How much, speaking of the wide receiver position, we've seen so many second, third round picks. I mean, Puka Nakua is a fifth round pick and he might have had the best season for a rookie in the history of the game. How much is this trend over the last, whatever it is, three to five years of day two and even day three receivers succeeding? How much does that play into it? And you go, you know, I, I like these receivers near the top, but I can get a receiver later. There's a lot of depth. Yeah, but you know, if you want an elite guy, I mean, Look, you can find Devontae Adams in 2014 as the eighth receiver taken. They, they, and you can find Puka last year, and that's true. But the elite receivers, whether it's – and they have come in and set this game on fire, Jamar, Justin, uh, C.D. Lamb. I mean, they've been taken in this first round. I mean, right. the talent level is – my mother's 91. She won a fantasy football league. She thinks she knows more football than me. My <laughs> mother can see the talent. That Jamar Chase it just has, proves okay? how arbitrary that damn game is, Baldy. Yeah, no, it proves <laughs> how smart his mom is. Of course, it does. Go this is Baldy was a legend. Like. She's from Pittsburgh. She knows what a receiver looks like. <laughs> oh yeah, hell yeah. Oh, so she's the secret sauce. She's been helping them pick all the great receivers. Yeah, <laughs> they have had some good fortune in those later rounds for sure. Yeah, no, there are there are some guys. There are some guys. You know, Andy and some other fellows at WEI have been doing some great breakdown podcast, position by position as well. Um, you know, I always try to tell myself, don't fall in love with players because in the, especially in the Belichick era, it's almost like his board in the, in the draft room, which was notoriously smaller. So I heard would always be like, whatever Pats fans want, go the opposite direction of it as well. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and sadly here we are. Um, but there are some other guys that I think could potentially be special as well. I love Javon Baker out of university of central Florida. Patriots have taken third meetings with Malachi Corley. I think he, Western Kentucky, Andy. Yeah, Western yeah, Kentucky. Yeah, let's yep. go watch him against Ohio State, you know, and yep. say, can this be Debo Samuel? Like, yep. you can convince yourself that his power after the catch, all that stuff is is pretty special. Yeah, and so that that's something that the team, this is something uh, we've been harping on, not just since the last season went to crap uh, very early on, obviously, uh, for years. There's no special on this team. Who else do you like? There's just no one. Well, what jersey do you want to buy? Who's really special? Like, and who's right. special in this draft that can make a difference aside from a QB to you? No, look, I mean, if you if you just compared, I mean, it was kind of silly, but but for this exercise, if you just compared the Kansas City Chiefs and the New England Patriots, you're like, how are they? How are they spending similar amount of money? Like, what are the Patriots spending their money on? I know they paid Matt Judon, which is fine. 
But like, I'll, but who they pay? Like, not one of those receivers that no. you, you you went to the event. Not one of those receivers could beat good man coverage last year. Nobody, nobody separated. I don't care. Juju, uh, Demario looked like he had a little juice to him for a while. Kendrick, like none of those guys beat man coverage. And so, if if they're not beating man coverage, like what good are they? What, what so like just line up and just press these guys the way Cleveland does and just take these guys out. You know, the way New Orleans does. New Orleans plays press man coverage. Mm-hmm. Lante Taylor, you know, Marshawn Lattimore. I mean, that's what they do. Like, nobody could win. So, you're right. Like, in, in Kansas City, I can say the center's special. Like, the guy never missed a game. He plays every snap. Obviously, the quarterback's the quarterback. This, the running back looks more special than Ramondre. Um, you know, the tight end is ridiculous, right? So, you go Chris Jones. You could just go through the whole roster and go, they're better at almost every single – how is that possible that they could both be spending similar amounts of money? To take a, a step back here for a second, what are you expecting? Because I feel like we're getting um, hopes up that this is going to be some dramatic draft. We're going to have trades. We're going to have – there could be six, seven quarterbacks in the first round. Is it a historic class of quarterbacks? Sort of your big-picture takeaway. First of all, do you believe the guy that's going number one overall is a – generational talent and does that jump start what might be a really entertaining historic draft night I do, I do think he's a difference maker I like Caleb I've known him since he was in high school I've done football camps with him I sat in the film room with him and watch him you know dissect defenses and how to attack it and where to go on your hot re- like he and then you watch him throw it when he was in high school and you go if he was in a combine you throw it as good when he was in high school throw it as good as anybody at the combine so I, I think he's pretty special. And I think Lincoln knows – Lincoln and Cliff have an idea what to do with quarterbacks. The, the, you know, there wasn't a lot of talent at USC this year, so they had to kind of make do with what they have. But I, I, I think he's special. I think we're going to see these quarterbacks get pushed up. And unfortunately, they get pushed up a lot of times for the wrong reasons, and that's why they fail. I mean, can your quarterback – I mean, you saw the best of all time for 20 years, right? So, you know, can you diagnose what the defense is doing and know how to beat it? Like over and with accuracy and just making the right decisions and the speed of decision making was just the best that we've ever seen. And that's kind of what you have to do. And so you can wow, you know, we, we, we throw terms around like off platform throws and this, that, like, okay, that's great. There's Mahomes could do it. Josh Allen could do it. A couple guys could do it, but ultimately you've got to beat, you got to do what Joe Burrow does. you got to beat people with the speed of decision, whether like pre-snap, post-snap, like, you got to carve these defenses up. I don't know how many of these guys, like it doesn't look like some of these guys in the draft do that very well to me. Do you care about winning? I mean, J.J. McCarthy is a winner, right? His record shows it. His ring finger shows it. Mac Jones was a winner until he wasn't a winner, whereas Drake May and Caleb Williams, people are like, hey, how come if you're so great and quarterback matters so much, how come you didn't win more? Does winning matter to you? It matters, but, you know, the college, if you're Michigan, and I don't know, they're going to have 15 guys drafted this weekend. Yeah, you know, all going to the you're Chargers. Playing, you're, you're playing Indiana. You're, I mean, I'm not here to knock these programs. You're playing Nebraska. You're playing these teams. Like, how hard is it to beat them? You know, I mean, Penn State always has talent. But, you know, if you just hand the ball off in the second half of the game against Penn State and beat them in a whiteout, like, okay, like, what? He's a very difficult guy to evaluate. And everybody says the same thing. Like, I can pull out plays against Ohio State. I can pull out some plays um, to Rome, Roman Wilson where he's got to be look pretty special. But it's not like he had to do that for, you know, two and a half years at Michigan, week in, week out. They didn't have to do those kind of things. So it's just difficult to evaluate. Now, you could go back and say, okay, coming out of high school, he's a five-star recruit. Ohio State spurned him. He got ticked off. He beat Ohio State three years in a row. Um, you, you can look at some of that stuff and – um, and find out what kind of competitor he is. His quarterback can come out, his coach can come out and say, with pure hyperbole, he's the best quarterback in this draft. I would expect him to say that. But he's a difficult guy to evaluate to me. And then you've got guys like uh, RG3 coming out saying, watch out, Spencer Rattler may be the best quarterback in this draft, and he's a hidden gem, bad situation, l- fell off, looked better. Who knows? Again, it's such a crapshoot. So, you know, I think your ideal of sticking to your conviction Find your guy, lock in, go into it, 
headstrong confidently. And then, you know, we'll see how it goes a couple of years later. Fortune often favors the bold. And speaking to that and in the entire idea of having confidence, it's been such a dysfunctional couple of years, obviously, the fall from grace of the organization. The docu-series doesn't go over well. Bad optics for ownership. Belichick's gone. Who even knows what was said in conversation with other owners? We just want to try to steer the ship in a positive direction and get back to enjoying football regionally, Brian, because it's kind of sucked the last couple of years. So No, I agree. And I, I do think, though, you know, I, I give Mr. Kraft a lot of credit. There was a succession sure. plan in place. I don't think people knew that Gerard was going to be the next guy up and, you know, Mike Vrabel and these guys that were out there, you know, that could have come back, um, didn't do it. But it, like it, it, there's a real general manager where you feel like a real guy's in charge of personnel and making these free agent decisions and rebuilding the roster. And so I feel like it's going to be a completely different way of doing things. I feel like already Elliot and Gerard have been pretty upfront uh, a lot more open than what you guys are used to seeing, which is fine. When you win, you're allowed to do and act any way you want to do um, when you consistently win. Um, I don't think, I think there's just going to be a different Patriot way. I think there's going to be a way. It's just going to be a lot different. And, and at least initially, it's probably going to be really refreshing. Now we got to see what the draft produces. We got to see how they compete in the division next year. And I think we're willing I mean, I, at least I am. I don't know about you, but I, I'm willing to give this thing a, a full year to, to kind of get some traction. And it might not look pretty next year, and I don't know what that means, how many games they win and how competitive they are and all that kind of stuff. But I'm willing to give it a full year, and let's just see how it goes. But it's going to be different. The way they do everything is going to be different. The building's going to feel different. And that's probably a good thing right now. Yeah, I'm a little more like Billy O'Brien. They used to call him the teapot, and he's ready to pop off at any moment. So I can't promise a year. I can give them until about 10 p.m. on Thursday night, and I'll wow. assess the first-round pick, yeah. and I might be popping off on the radio for about three hours afterwards if they take J.J. McCarthy because that's that's the one rumbling and rumor that has me concerned is like this idea that Elliot reportedly likes J.J. McCarthy and – I have my doubts as to whether he can strap the New England Patriots to his back and take us to the promised land the way 12 used to do. Well, if that's true, let, let's just say that's true, Andy. Like, that would concern me that because there's never been really any leaks ever up there. And so I don't like an organization that has leaks. I like organizations that might surprise you because the leaks felt like they were so real. But that would that would concern me if somebody is the mouthpiece for Elliot and – you know, they're they're sort of already putting this stuff out there. That that that'd be a little concerning to me. Like the one thing I liked about the way things were operated on uh, before is that it was pretty airtight in that building, and and that's a that's a good way to do business. Yeah, and seems like you have a reasonable amount of confidence that Wolf and Mayo can run a competent program because we we haven't even like it's crazy to think that for the amount of accomplishment that the Belichick's and Brady's and of course, all the supporting players from McGinnis and Brewski all the way up through Vrabel, yep. Ninkovich, Gronkowski and Edelman had together that. Yeah. Like it's a, it's a roster bereft of talent. Things were in turnaround. We had a defensive coordinator calling offensive plays. Like I just want stability. So do you yep. think at least right now, this is an ownership group and a managerial group and a coaching group that can give us some stability. Now you add in a good draft, one that makes Andy not want to fly off the handle on the radio and get an FCC fine that maybe we can be, can we be competitive in the AFC East at least next year or within two years, Brian? I think within two years, you make the right moves. We got to see what the staff looks like. I like, if you want to bring back Dante Skarniecki, bring back Dante. I'm I'm all for it. Okay, absolutely. Like, I know the offense line, but I'm not. I'm I joking. But, can we rehire Ernie Adams too? Okay, so uh, you know, look, um, nothing, you know, nothing succeeds like winning. So we, it, that's the, like I think the Dolphins' offense can be elite. I think the Jets are super talented. We'll see if the quarterback can stay upright. Um, you know, I think Buffalo is in transition, but uh, that quarterback is so special. Who knows? So I'm not going to rule rule against it. And they have stability in that organization. They made one move, and it was the right move last year when they fired the offense coordinator and elevated Joe Brady. It was the right move. Those are, dis are difficult decisions. I want to see what Gerard and his staff look like. If it's the same staff and we see steady improvement in player development, then Gerard did a great job bringing the staff in. 
Um, we, but we won't know that until probably during the season when we either see this, um, this development or we see lack of development and we hear these rumblings that always take place when there's issues within the coaching staff. Baldy, when you, um, for years, we kind of had a feel for what the Patriot draft way was. As Fitzy alluded to, they off went off the board and Cole Strange, three rounds to her, whatever. But you kind of knew what kind of players they were looking for and different things of that nature. This new era, assuming it is the Elliot Wolf era, he talked about bringing in the Packer way. Obviously, he had close ties there. He had his tenure in Cleveland. Do you have a feel from people you've talked to or just knowing Elliot Wolf and history in the Packer way? Do you have a feel like what kind of players are now Patriot players in general and what they might be looking for across the board? Not not really. But one thing that always was in the back of my mind, you know, ever since Richard Seymour was there and Willie and those guys, like it seemed like they always had Chris, you know, like Jones was there and I, they wouldn't pay pass rushers, right? They always let them go. Yeah. Yep. And it just seemed bizarre to me. Like every good defense is built around your pass rush. And like, let's go get those guys. Now, Matt Judon is a very good player, but he had to go free agency to find him. Um, and he had to overpay for him. Now, you know, last year's injury was injured, but he's a good player. Like, why don't you just start with drafting some really good pass rushers? Like, and developing those guys. And maybe Josh Uche can get back. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, I, I just think it was like, okay, we're going we're gonna to play this style of defense where we're going to have multiple fronts and we're going to break you down and break your protection down. And Dietrich Wise can get sacks. Or, yep. you know, Adam Butler can get sacks. I'm like, stop that. Go get yourself animals up front to get after the quarterbacks. Like, get your quarterback. Protect your quarterback on the edges with good tackles, which I haven't seen in a long time. And then get yourself some animals that beat those tackles to get to the quarterback. Like, just that seems like a good system. And it never really fails if you kind of believe in that philosophy. Yeah, that's that's why Patriots fans would lose their mind if they took a tackle in the first round and then a guy that I love, Fisk, the defensive lineman out of Florida State. You want to talk about an animal or somebody who just wants to inflict violence upon like it, it wouldn't be sexy, Andy, and people would be like, ah, but we need a receiver and we need quarterback. A yeah, who's the, who's throwing the ball? Doesn't who's matter. I mean, defense has been the hallmark and the calling card for years. The offense needs a ton of work as well. Um, you know, we, we could, you know, try to find diamonds in the rough and figure out who else they would play for uh, they could possibly get Bali. But I'm I'm with you. Just build dominate in the trenches again, find a couple of people that can make a difference in the outside. I know they need a court. There's just so much they need. That's why we have to give it time. So yeah. anyway, we've used up a ton of years today as well. Folks, if you want to follow him for the best in breakdowns as well, you can see him on the NFL network, his breakdowns and his analysis, his rankings are uh, peerless at Baldy NFL. And if you want to find out which centers, which linemen, which tackles, which receivers he's in love with, He's got rankings galore all over his Twitter feed as well. I mean, Jackson so. Powers Johnson with the third pick is a great pick. I mean, let's, go, <laughs> I, let's go fix the offense a lot. Crazy thing is, I saw that guy at the combine, and I was just sort of like, "I'll build a team around that mf effort. Exactly. He's a badass." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Well, really throwing some curveballs. So, which quarterback <laughs> they taken? Before we let you go, if you had to guess number three, or if they make a move, which quarterback at the end of draft night will be a new Patriot? I would say if they stay there at three, they're going to take Drake. Yes, that's what I like to hear. That, that's what I that's what I would think. I don't think they're going to reach, uh, but if they take a quarterback and stay at three, I think that's the guy they're going to take. Uh, I'm Drake, happy. That just earned them a year. I'll wait a year if they take Drake May. They're a draft and develop team, and they told you they love picks. I I want them to trade back and go Penix and Guyton in the first round. Grab a receiver like Xavier Leggett, top of the second round. Your first three needs are all addressed by the very top of the second round. Friday night at seven ten p.m. I'm thinking, hey. We're on the road to recovery here, but again. Well, look, Fitz, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take what you just said. We're going to put it in the vault. Then we're going to come back, and we're going to we're going to revisit it two years from now, okay. and we'll see which one should be running a football team. Should it be <laughs> Elliot and Gerard, or should it be Fitzy and, and Andy right here? I want, I want to put that in the vault. All I like right. it. We'll do so, my man. Uh, thanks very much for your time, as always, Brian. Yep. On the NFL Network, the Odyssey NFL Insider as well. This has been Six Rings and Football Things, brought to you by WEI 
Odyssey and 2400 Sports. The draft is less than a week away. Oh, thank God we can stop with the talk and get to the picking. Take care, everybody. That's Baldy. He's Andy. I'm Fitzy. We'll talk to you soon. Good day. God bless. And as